Hi, my name is Noble Jones and I failed big time. I actually failed so hard that a few years after I failed, I decided to make a TED talk about it. But <laughs> let me catch you up to that point first. See, from preschool until sixth grade, I attended a Montessori school. Some of you may be familiar with the unique perspectives of a Montessori school. Maybe you've heard of it before or Maybe you think Montessori is a type of cheese. That's okay. Let me briefly explain the methods associated with this style of education. In Montessori school, students essentially teach themselves. There's no homework, no tests, no desks, no grades, no conventional teaching. It's purely built on your own will to learn and collaborate with others. Understandably, many would assume that you don't really end up learning anything in Montessori school. Students didn't dive too deep into math or history or English because what we learned in Montessori school was a different set of very useful skills. I was constantly exposed to an environment that promotes student autonomy. Montessori school is essentially supervised freedom to do whatever you want within that classroom. Around the room there were books, science experiments, mathematical contraptions. Everything was meant to engage you in something that you could learn from. My ability to be decisive whilst also making the best decision for myself was being exercised every single day, which allowed me to find and refine my own methods of personal productivity. I was also able to discover myself and my own interests early on by engaging my creativity. Some of the personal projects that my friends and I invested our time into included a Greek mythology board game, a comic book about an edamame bean with superpowers, and a 30 minute long short film adapted from that comic book, which <laughs> My mother kindly spent hours sewing together some very interesting costumes for. My social skills were constantly exercised as students were encouraged to work with others and ask fellow students for help whenever we needed it. We had this thing called snack time where two students at a time could have a snack and take a break. Of course, it very often turned into an eight-person team huddle, but I just remember it becoming second nature for me to ask my friends if we'd like to discuss our project over snack time in the future. Leadership played a massive role in students' day-to-day -day activities as well. For example, every week there was this thing where six to eight students from any of the grades were randomly selected to be that week's hot lunch cooks. It was like the Hunger Games. The cooks would go to a grocery store with a teacher to get ingredients and then return to the school to cook an entire meal for everybody. The honor of serving that food to my fellow students, as well as eating it myself, felt amazing. Now, I remember talking with my friends who went to a traditional school. They would always talk about their grades, or the teacher that was giving them a hard time, or the project they had to work on, and then I would chime in with stories about the huge batch of pasta that I cooked for my entire school. No, my Montessori school only went up to eighth grade, so I always knew that one day I'd have to find out what those letters were that defined students' abilities, but it never really hit me until sixth grade. As fifth grade was wrapping up, my parents separated and my dad moved to South Pasadena. It was around halfway through sixth grade that we began discussion about potentially moving schools. As the idea worked its way into conversation more and more frequently, I eventually started to realize that my time at Montessori school was coming to an end. It felt weirdly sudden because in the span of a couple months my parents divorced and I was now required to count the finite amount of days until I would be switching to an entirely different form of education. That summer was hard. I remember doing some extensive research on how to use a locker, how to operate a personal email, what a backpack is for, and the odds of being bullied, which were a lot higher than Little Noble had expected. <laughs> Everything felt so foreign to me. I just remember the first day of school coming around and I was lost. I remember holding my little card that had all my classes on it and I was so confused because there were six different rooms on there. It made no sense. Why do you need that many rooms? Of course, I had no idea how to find any of them, so of course I approached an adult and, like I was a tourist, asked for directions. I got into Miss Williams' first period science class and began walking around looking at all the skeletons and jars of random lifeless matter. To me, the day had started and I was doing what I was supposed to do. But of course, as the bell rang and I was the only one wandering around the room as every other student was seated watching me, 
I caught the hint that I was possibly doing it all wrong. So I took a seat next to a couple random students and immediately struck up a conversation. But of course, the classroom isn't for conversation, which I happened to learn as poor Miss Williams very nicely, but constantly asked me to keep myself on a low volume setting. <laughs> My remaining classes for the day looked similar. It was a lot of talking and dozing off and this was the first time I ever questioned whether the clock was moving backwards, forcing me into a limbo of some sorts within those classrooms. I just remember getting my first homework assignments. I came home and quite literally threw them away. I didn't feel like doing it, so therefore I didn't have to, right? Well, the falsehood of my ways very rapidly became apparent to me as my teachers pulled me aside and asked why I wasn't doing the mandatory work. Mandatory. That is just no fun. <laughs> Tests became a beast that I just could not tame. I remember talking out loud to my fellow students on my first test, asking for help on the answers. The fear in those students' eyes <laughs> as they ignored me. I will never forget. Desks became a problem too. I just could <laughs> not sit still. And going to the bathroom sucked even more. No longer could I put my bathroom name tag on the bathroom board and leave whenever I wanted. I now had to raise my hand and practically announce to the class that I had to go. As the first semester of seventh grade wrapped up, grades officially came in and I found that in every single one of my classes I had a very solid F. <laughs> to the students listening, I know this is nightmare material. I just remember when my parents caught wind of my grade reports over winter break, they actually did something I will always be grateful for. They didn't sit me down and scold me because they knew how challenging this change really was for me. I just remember my father asking me a very simple question. What are you going to do about it? I took that question to heart and made them a promise that by the end of the second semester, I would have good grades. So. I had to start somewhere. And luckily, I had an entire winter break to prepare. Here's the thing. Failure sucks big time. Everybody knows firsthand how true that is. As weird as it is, it's a lot easier to sit in your own failure than to do something about it. But it's important to remind yourself that everyone experiences failure. Sometimes we look up to the people we look up to, and we compare ourselves. But that's the thing. You're looking up to them for a reason. They got there for a reason. They stood exactly where you are, and they looked up towards what they wanted to be. Except they didn't just look up, they looked in. It's so crucial to remind yourself that the failure you're experiencing is a part of the process and is bringing you closer to your goals. So many people hear the word failure and are revolted by it, but remind yourself that failure is also progress. And without progress, you're never going to succeed. I sent out a couple surveys to SPHS students regarding failure and gathered over 200 responses. Of the students surveyed, nearly 50% would rather avoid failure than ever accept it. 15% fear failure altogether and would avoid it at all costs. It's only 29% that are willing to accept it. See, failure is not something to be avoided or feared because each time you fail, you learn and you grow and you discover. Failure is just the optimization of your success. Now, I also asked those same surveyed students what their definition of success was. Some of the most popular answers included money, getting good grades and passing school, happiness, achieving a goal and not failing. Well, everybody always has their own definitions of success, but I think one thing that should stay true among them all is that success is not the attainment of a single goal, but rather the continuous efforts to improve and achieve personal feats. Success isn't the absence of failure, but rather the culmination. I mean, I failed big time. The word fail was quite literally written all over my report card. <laughs> but do I regret that? No. Because if I never failed those classes, I never would have challenged myself to pass them. I took that winter break to remind myself that those grades didn't define me. Just because I failed those classes doesn't mean I'm going to fail every single class for the rest of my life. It doesn't even mean I'm going to fail just one more class, because that is all up to me. 
That's all up to what I'm going to do about it. And I chose to do something about it. With failure, it's important to note mistakes. So many people turn the reflection of their failure into a chance to ruthlessly destroy themselves from the inside out. But don't mentally knock yourself out. All that does is sink you deeper and deeper into the failure. You aren't getting anywhere. It's self-destructive. It's also extremely important not to reach the exact opposite of that. A pretty sneaky way people avoid failure is with blame. They have to pin their failure onto something external. As Brene Brown puts it in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, our first response to pain, ours or someone else's, is to self-protect. We protect ourselves by looking for someone or something to blame. Maybe you unfortunately got a bad score on the SAT. Some people will blame the students around them for sneezing and distracting them, or blame the proctor for starting a few minutes too late. You see, blame pretends to take the weight of failure off of you, when in reality, it's just preparing you to make the same mistakes next time. Other people's immediate reaction to failure is to disqualify certain reasons. They write off the fact that it could be because they got four hours of sleep the night before, or that they didn't study enough, because they don't want to have to change those things. You see, reflection requires a simple and careful analysis of what happened. We need to reach the middle of these two extremes. Instead of stumbling and falling into your own harsh self-criticisms or completely ignoring the fact that you had anything to do with your own failure, we need to accept the reality of our current failure with the image of our future success. We need to note the mistakes honestly and make it our mission not to avoid them, but rather to improve upon them. I also took that winter break to talk with my parents. I listed all of the reasons I thought I was failing my classes. Now, my list did not include a bunch of personal insults, like I suck at studying and I'm bad at math. They included things such as, I need to find a way to make studying a habit. I need to, need to get extra math help. I noticed that I wasn't holding myself accountable for my work. It still felt optional. I needed to find a way to consistently do my work regardless of whether or not I wanted to do it. I needed to develop my discipline. The thing is, sometimes we get lost in failure, listing all the reasons that we didn't succeed rather than honing in on the ways that we will succeed. Failure is a weight that you don't need to carry for the rest of your life. At some point, you must take what you need and leave what you don't. Revisit your goals. What are you working towards? Why are you striving to do this? How are you working towards this? Is your approach working? Well, I was working towards bettering my grades. I was striving to do this because I wanted to be a good student. I wanted to succeed in my education. How was I working towards this? Well, at the time, I wasn't really doing anything to work towards this. That's a dead giveaway as to why I wasn't getting anywhere. Luckily, reflecting on the reasons why I was failing led me exactly to what I needed to do moving forward. Was my approach working? Well, obviously not. But this can be much harder to answer sometimes. Because as I add and take from my approach, its effectiveness will fluctuate. This is exactly what failure is for, though. Finding what to add, to take, to change, or to keep the same. See, revisiting your goals with all of this in mind can instill a motivation that will push you past your success with more experience, knowledge, and understanding of your success. You know, sometimes we fail and then use that failure as a basis for all of our future attempts. This can lead to us not taking necessary risks. From my surveys, I gather that the top three areas students are most likely to be reluctant to take risks in are education, academics, personal life, and relationships. Taking risks is so vital, especially in academics for us students. You see, so many people worry about hitting a certain mark for colleges or maintaining something within the norm to ensure that they look good. But taking a step outside of that norm in your own direction, finding passion and success outside of that norm is what not only brings you closer to your interests and true passions, but also makes you stand out. You know, as the second semester of seventh grade came around, I knew I needed to take some academic risks and choose to try my hardest to discover my own methods regardless of whether it would end up working out or not. I used what Montessori had taught me as the basis for my plan to change my ways and succeed. I think the biggest thing that Montessori taught me is that it's OK to ask for help. Sometimes you just don't know what you're doing. But if you want to know what you're doing, it could help to ask someone who knows what they're doing. 
Once again, Brene Brown provides some insight here as to the fact that somehow we've come to equate success with not needing anyone. Many of us are quick to extend a helping hand but are reluctant to reach for help when we need it ourselves. It's as if we've divided the world into those who offer help and those who need it, when the truth is we are both. I went to every single one of my teachers and I told them I'm really struggling to adapt to this school, but I'm looking to improve. How do you think I can do that? To which all of them helped me out. Some of them sat down with me after school to give me some extra help. Others provided some deadline extensions when I was really having trouble. I also told my parents it would really help if you could keep me accountable, so they did. They would remind me to do my homework and to study, and sometimes they would sit down with me and do it too. Now, I think something that really helped as I was dealing with this failure was having someone to look up to. It can be really motivational to have someone there that can support you through their experience and understanding of both failure and success. That they, they can remind you that you've got this. For me, I think that was my dad, who was like a mentor to me. He decided to take a large necessary risk. You see, for a while, my dad was a realtor, but he really didn't enjoy it and didn't like how it was going for him. He could have stayed in that job and probably been just fine, but he decided to take a risk. For a large portion of his adult life, my father has had ADHD. It has affected him and his work in some very critical ways, and he's always wanted to find a way to help others who are experiencing the same thing. So, after some thinking, he dropped out of his job as a realtor, got a job as a UPS driver, and started a podcast and website called ADHD Big Brother as a way to share his methods and help adults that need ADHD help. I remember when he explained his plan to my brother and I, and we were confused, but we were absolutely there for it. Episode after episode didn't really go anywhere. They didn't really get much attention for a while, but today, my father has amassed hundreds of thousands of podcast downloads, runs a subscription forum with over 30 members, and coaches an international mix of adults that need ADHD help. My father took a risk. He failed, and he failed, and he failed. And now all we know is a steadily growing success. I take that mindset with me wherever I go. And I took that mindset with me as I moved through the second semester of seventh grade. Slowly but surely, I was adjusting. I wasn't a sudden genius with easy A's dropping into my hands. I still found myself failing occasionally. But I always knew that as long as I could handle it correctly, I was going to be all right. Finally, the second semester ended and grades officially came in. I got all A's. That's right. I celebrated, and of course, I felt so unbelievably accomplished. And the best part is that it never felt like a battle. It felt like a process. Now, as I'm ending the second half of my senior year and reflecting on my life as a Montessori kid and the challenges that I faced as I left that environment behind me, that period in my life taught me some of the most important lessons I've ever learned, and I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything. I found that whether life is challenging or as easy as it's ever been, you are your own best friend. Sometimes life throws a fork in the road and things are left up to chance, but the only unchangeable variable is who decides which path to take. You. If your, hand, if your life was left in the hands of another, I'm sure you would treat them very kindly. So of course, as your life rests in your hands, be kind to yourself. Now, we're, while you're the only one that can change yourself, it's always okay to ask for help. As high school students, so much is shoveled onto our shoulders and expected of us. We just don't know what to do with it all. But the chances are somebody does know what to do with it all. And if you don't allow yourself to ask for that help and to receive that help, you're going to find things to be a lot more difficult than they have to be. Now, after nearly a decade in Montessori school, I think I'm entitled to say that life is like Montessori school. There's nobody that can assign you homework or tests or give you a letter grade. There's nobody that's going to stick you in a desk and tell you what to do. It was just me in that room with a will to do something, anything I put my mind to, surrounded by people in a similar situation. And it is just you in this world with the opportunities provided to you, surrounded by those in a similar situation with similar opportunities. The only difference is what you decide to do and how you decide to approach it. So, in the words of my parents, just moments after receiving the horror that was my first report card, what are you going to do about it?
Thank you.